did have a really, really incredible time at Perth. Um, convention exhibition, exhibition Centre last weekend. Uh, like I said, powerful statement uh, to make in the heart of our city. If you didn't manage to be in the room for some reason or another, I do hope that you'll take the time to catch up online and really jump in on what God is saying and really lean in to what happened um, last weekend. It really was something for the history books and, and we don't want anyone to be left behind on what the Lord is saying to the church this year. And, and for those of you who were there, um, you would know that uh, PK declared to us that the intention of God for this house, for our life, is here and now. Who remembers that? It's here and it is now. We can no longer sit back with a I'll just wait and see mentality. The pandemic taught us to do that. Wait and see what happens. Wait and see if we feel like it. Who knows waiting and seeing if you feel like it, if you're anything like me, that may never happen. You know, <laughs> sometimes I tell myself, don't feel, just do. You know, we can't, we can't wait and see. There needs to be understanding that God is doing something here and now. There's a particular urgency here and now. He has anointing to release here and now. He has purpose to unfold like God is ready. His readiness is not in question. The big question is, is His church ready? Are we as a people ready? Are we kind of stuck in a uh, a wait and see mentality? Or are we eagerly partnering with what God wants to do here and now? And, And Ken went on to express in his message different areas where he's sensing, particularly that God is wanting to do something in our midst here and now, and that is in the area of our prayer, here and now in prayer, here and now in discipleship, here and now in the area of our spiritual hunger, here and now to extend our reach beyond the four walls of the church and So today, as a springboarding off of that message, I feel to hone in on a particular theological understanding that is going to underpin how well we can actually embrace all of the here and now things that God is wanting to do. I want to take us to a foundational truth, if you like, that will actually establish us in our prayer life. And it will actually fuel us in our discipleship and our spiritual hunger. And so that truth I want to have a look at is, do we have a robust understanding of our standing before God? Our standing before God. That's what we're going to have a deep look at today. What do I mean when I say our standing before God? Well, it's our mindsets about how we think God thinks about us. It's our mindsets about how we perceive our worthiness before the Lord. And that's where I I want to hone in on because an immature understanding in this area will actually contribute to challenges in your prayer life, challenges in your discipleship life. There may actually be stumbling blocks to your faith life in many different ways. And that's why we need to go after it. See, See, the fundamental thing at us you know, most basic form, the fundamental thing we need to know and, and cling to is that our standing before God is established in Jesus Christ. Like, spoiler alert, I've just given you the end. <laughs> you know, it's established in Christ. We can come into God's presence for one reason and one reason alone is because God has established us in Jesus Christ because of Him. It's not because of the church we attend, although I think we attend a pretty good church. <laughs> you know, it's not because of your family of origin. It's not because of your praying grandma, although she probably is a very powerful woman <laughs> and probably helped a lot. You know, who loves a good praying grandma? <laughs> Thank you to all the praying grandmas, you know, but it's not because of her. It's because of Jesus. It's because of his sacrificial work at the cross, full stop. 
He establishes our standing before God. And this enduring truth is confirmed to us over and over and over again in His Word as we, as we flick through the Scriptures. And we're going to have a rapid fire look at a bunch of Scriptures that say so, starting in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. But it, sa- it says, But now in Christ Jesus, say in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21, He made Christ who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that in Him, say in Him, in Him we would become the righteousness of God. That is, we would be made acceptable to Him and placed in right relationship, right standing with Him by His gracious loving kindness. Next slide. Colossians 1 verse 21. Once you were alienated from God. Remember that? Once you were alienated from God and you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour. But now, say but now. But now it's different. He has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in His sight, you without blemish and free from accusation. Galatians 4, verse 4 and 5. But when the right time came, God sent His Son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent Him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that He could adopt us as His very own children. You are a son, you are a daughter when you are in Jesus. Can we give Him some glory? Is the word doing someone some good today? Hallelujah. So this is just a tiny selection, just a small little sample, if you like, of truths from His Word that speaks to us about this glorious standing that we have before God our Father, telling us beautiful things like we have been brought near. We're not far off. We're righteous before Him. We're holy in His sight, free from accusation. We are adopted as His children. But all of those truths, as many and varied as they are, they're all only available to us because of Jesus. And you see the language of Christ right there, right alongside every descriptor of our standing. Standing in Christ, before God rather, Jesus is right there. It says, review some of the language, but now in Christ Jesus, for through Him, so that in Him, by His body, God sent Him, and so on and so forth. The point being, we can't, we couldn't, we won't ever achieve any of this standing in and of ourselves. It's all only always in Jesus. And you might be saying to me at this point, well, that's a little bit elementary, Chrissy. Like, I, I know I can come to God in Jesus. I, I get that. And I'm just wanting to push back on the sentiment just a little bit today and ask, well, how well do you know it? How deeply do you know it? Because if we're so good at knowing our standing before God in Christ Jesus, then why do we still so often want to make it about ourselves. Why is it that we go there and try and make it about me, about you? And I want to preach to you today on this thought, works don't work. <laughs> work turn to your neighbor and say, works don't work. Works don't work. <laughs> This is what I see and have seen for years in my own life, and I see it, I hear it from the mouths of so many others, is that in our life of faith, we still get so caught up in our own works, in our own behaviour. We're very aware of what we have done or what we haven't done, of our performance. Was it good or was it bad? Are we right or are we wrong? And we bring this works consciousness into the presence of God. Sometimes we do it blatantly or sometimes it just happens very subtly, very subconsciously, but it is there. There can be a preoccupation in us about us. 
You know what I'm saying? As we stand before God, there becomes this curious questioning within us about whether or not we're the type of person that God could actually really use. Like whether or not we're the type of person God could actually hear my prayers. He could actually do a miracle in my life and in my family and for me and that sort of thing. And sometimes we feel that God won't answer our prayers because we haven't prayed enough. Because we haven't read enough, because we haven't done enough, we haven't served enough, we're not like that person, or we're not like that person, or maybe we did do something, but we have this sneaking suspicion we didn't do it right. Like whatever right even is, right can be very slippery, right, right, right can be very elusive. And maybe there's this underlying fear in us that we're probably going to be rejected or at the very least be held at an arm's length because of failures, because of flaws, because of imperfections and those things we see in ourselves that have probably disqualified us or so we think. Sometimes we struggle with feelings of guilt and shame in His presence Because when we come to God, there's that nagging, persistent voice in our head telling us of everything we're not, everything we haven't done, and this and that and the other. Some even stay away from church. They stay away from fellowship because they just don't feel good enough. They don't feel worthy. I spent so many years wrestling with these very things. I never quite knew where I stood with God. I never quite knew if the Lord was pleased with me. I mean, how could he possibly be pleased with me? Look at my works. <laughs> you know, look at look, all those times when I had, I knew, I knew the truth. I hadn't read enough. I knew the truth. I hadn't been a woman of persistent prayer. I knew that I was struggling with persistent uh, particular disciplines in my life or different struggles, different challenges, things that I should be over by now, but guess what? I'm not. You know, like, and I knew that about myself and I was often unimpressed with myself and thought, therefore, God surely must be unimpressed with me too. Every time I came into his presence, there's the voice accusation. Sometimes even when preaching on this stage, it's right there. You're not good enough. You're not this. You're not that. You're that, that, that. On and on and on it would go, reminding me of everything that I wasn't and the mess that I was in. And I thought that there were all the other people that had it together. And then there was me. Has anyone ever related to that feeling? All the other spiritual people around you that you think have got it together, it's a lie. (laughs) No one got it together. (laughs) No one got it together. Well, let's expose that in Jesus' name. But the result of all the works mentality going on in my life was I was messy on the inside. You know, sometimes I'm feeling defeated and often I'm striving to try and compensate for the defeat that I feel, inevitably failing, inevitably underperforming in my own estimation and therefore confirming to myself again and again and again that I really was not that good. Maybe some of you can relate to some of that. I just want to say works don't work. Works don't work. Maybe these mindsets aren't pervading in your life, like they're not in everything all of the time. But I would guess that they're in some of the things some of the time. You know, that you see some of those traits in your own self. And when those sneaky mindsets get in, and when they get a hold of us, it's not like they're harmless. They have an effect, a negative effect, a really awful effect in our life because the condemned believer is not confident in purpose. And the one that feels disqualified continually will not be being faithful and persistent in prayer. In in these types of places, we are not boldly approaching the throne of grace as it tells us to do in the book of Hebrews. So these mindsets become obstacles to our prayer and discipleship, obstacles to our faith and to our hunger and to all of our faith life in many and varied ways so that God can't do in us all that He's wanting to do in us. Not because he's limited, but because we're limited. You understand? So we need to deal with it. We need to deal with this works mentality and consciously eradicate all traces of it out of our thinking. We need to get back to grace. Turn to your neighbour and say, get back to grace. 
It's not really surprising that we would sometimes bring a works consciousness into our relationship with God and our standing before Him because when you think about it, almost every part of this world that we live in is actually, it reinforces to us and it expects a performance-based sort of life from us. Like think about work, at work, who has performance management at work? Like you've got KPIs, you've got key indicators that are going to let you know whether or not you are performing. And guess what? If you're not, you're out. You can get the sack. It's a rough world. It's a tough world, but that's the way the world works. And it's the same at school and uni, is it not? Did you pass or did you fail? Did you get it right or did you get it wrong? You know, even in family relationships and, and other spousal relationships and relationships that are supposed to be, a bit more unconditional in in nature, even in those relationships, we've probably all had moments of awareness that we weren't performing. You know, we weren't up to scratch. We weren't getting it right. And maybe some of us have experienced wounds of rejection in that place. And, and, And because of those relationships where love and affirmation have been removed from our life because of what we weren't or what we had or hadn't done and so on and so forth. And, you know, I know that's a complex matter, you know, interpersonal relationships are tricky and I'm not about to comment on all the ins and outs of that, but the point is we live in a performance-based world. The world system is a performance-based system, so it's a little, it's little wonder we bring that mentality into our faith life, into the presence of God and our thinking when it comes to our standing before Him, thinking that our goodness or badness or our rightness or our wrongness, the thinking that those are the parameters which determine our standing before Him, but that is absolutely not the case. And to think like that, to dwell in that thinking is actually unbiblical thinking. Because God is God. He's not your boss. He is your boss in some ways, but he's not like, you know, Mike at the office. He's he's different nature. Anyone got a boss called Mike? Surely, surely. No, nothing. Okay. John? (laughs) No, moving on. You know? (laughs) But he's not like, he's not your boss. He hasn't laid out your KPIs. (laughs) He's not your parent, your husband, your wife, your pastor. He's none of those roles blown up on a big scale. He is God. He's God. And he has established, the scripture is so clear, a new covenant for you in the blood of Jesus Christ, in the blood of his own son. And it is a covenant of grace. It is not a covenant of works. So that never again would you be welcomed into his presence on the basis of your your works, but you're only ever going to be welcomed in on the basis of your faith in His grace that He has expressed to you in Jesus Christ. Amen. Like your bad is never going to be bad enough to keep you out. Glory to God. But your good is never going to be good enough to get you in. Works don't work. It's a covenant of grace. God determined it in his own wisdom that your works, be they good or bad, they're not the measure he's measuring by. Praise the Lord. He's measuring by a different measure. That is the spilt blood of his own precious son, that eternal sacrifice. Jesus' blood is holy and pure and an eternal sacrifice that even right now, Like right now on the 26th of February, 2023, his blood is speaking for you in the presence of the Father, declaring worthy. Today, he is declaring you worthy in the presence of his own Father. Everybody that comes to him in faith is declared worthy in God's presence. So the only question that's relevant before God's throne is not, am I enough? That's the wrong question. But is Jesus enough? Is Jesus enough? And the answer to the question, is Jesus enough, will always be yes. And because he is always enough, that means you are always enough when you come to God in him. 
Can someone say amen? Paul puts it like this in Ephesians chapter 1. It says, the Father has made us accepted in the Beloved. Accepted in the Beloved. What a magnificent phrase. Accepted in the Beloved. The Beloved is Jesus. It means that you are accepted in Him. So whenever you come to God through your faith in Jesus Christ, you're accepted. You're never rejected. You're accepted in the beloved. End of story. When you come in faith in Jesus, he's not looking at your imperfect work. He's looking at his son's finished work. He's not looking at your imperfect work. When you come in Jesus, he's looking at his son's finished work. And therefore, there is no rejection. He does not reject the perfection of the Son. He embraces so that you are accepted in the Beloved. What's more, His victory becomes your victory. And His righteousness becomes your righteousness. And His standing becomes your standing. This is amazing grace. This is amazing grace. Glorious grace. And it's little wonder. That the enemy wants to keep us so caught up in a works mentality and a performance mentality. He wants to keep us defeated with his voice of condemnation and his voice of accusation. Because in that place, we are so limited. And in that place, we tend to sit down and shut up. We're certainly not the people rising up confidently, confidently declaring all that He has accomplished for us in Jesus' name, right? And we need to allow the knowledge of this grace to permeate every single part of us. It was Charles Spurgeon who actually said, it's a quote from him, you need to get the real atonement of Christ thoroughly into your soul. Thoroughly into your soul. Like in the deepest parts of you. So so let me ask you this question. The idea of acceptance, your personal acceptance in the beloved, that you're accepted in Christ. Is that truth thoroughly in your soul? Every day in your soul? Because I think that sometimes that's the problem. Our head can know something. But it hasn't penetrated, it hasn't translated yet into the deepest parts of our heart and our soul. It reminds me of Isaiah recently. We went to Bali, we had a holiday, and poor kid comes back with gastro. It it happens. (laughs) And he could not keep anything down. Not, Not a thing. He couldn't keep it down. He's like vomiting and he's got really high fevers in this in this gastro space, like not a happy camper. And because of the fevers, we really wanted to give him Panadol uh, to try and bring that fever down. And so we would give it to him. And what would happen? He would ingest it. But before his body could digest it, before his body you know, could absorb it, he would vomit it all out. So there were these violent forces operating inside of him called Bali Belly. <laughs> But that, that were expelling this medicine, expelling what was actually good for him before he could truly absorb it and, and before it would have an effect. And, and I think it can be the same with us. We can ingest a truth about the grace of God and we can understand it. But before the truth can be digested, before the truth can be fully absorbed, the violent forces of a works mentality and a performance mentality actually vomit it out. We find that our performance-based worldview actually has a strong hold. And the rejection that we've felt from people, that also has a strong hold. And the voice of the accusation is very, very loud. And these strong holds compete against the radical truth of God's love, grace and acceptance in Jesus. So that maybe we've had enough truth to inform us, but we've not had enough truth to transform us. So we struggle along under condemnation, under accusation, trying to earn our way to God to please Him. 
and in that place probably not doing much significant things for the kingdom. And trust me, it's a miserable way to live. Grace is a better way, amen? Grace is a better way. There's a case study in the scriptures about a people that struggled with works. So there was debate raging amongst the Christians in Galatia about righteousness through the law or righteousness through works versus righteousness through grace, the gospel of grace. And, and this works mentality within Jewish Christians was so deeply entrenched after millennia of kind of the Mosaic law, they were struggling to fully receive the gospel of grace. They had powerful forces within them that wanted to add works to grace. And they were imposing this thinking on other people too, telling Gentile believers that they had to follow various aspects of the law and be circumcised. And then only could they receive salvation in Jesus. So it was like this hybrid gospel that they were promoting amongst the Gentile Christians, a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of works. A little bit of what God can do and a little bit of what I can do. And Paul goes after their thinking in absolutely no uncertain terms and tells us that a hybrid gospel is no gospel at all. He says, even if an angel from heaven preaches a different gospel to you than what I have preached, you know, let them be cursed. (laughs) With strong language, a hybrid gospel is no gospel at all. And he says this in Galatians 3. As he's addressing these issues, he says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Christ Jesus was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning by means of the Spirit? Are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Your works? Have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? So I ask again, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by you believing what you heard? It's a powerful passage of scripture, isn't it? It really speaks into the heart of this issue. And Paul makes it abundantly clear to these Christians, works don't work. Works don't work. He says to them later, if you were to read on in chapter five, he says, when you're in Christ... Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What means something, what counts is your faith in Jesus. That's what counts. Then they, these Christians here, were trying to be blessed and grow spiritually on the basis of earning and deserving. They wanted to feel like they earned it and, and that, that they'd worked for it and they deserved it. But Paul thoroughly corrects their thinking and he tells them that under grace... We are blessed and grow spiritually, not through earning and deserving, but always only simply through believing and receiving. The Spirit is given by believing and receiving. Did you earn the Holy Spirit? Do you deserve the Holy Spirit? The Spirit's given through believing and receiving miracles occur by believing and receiving it was true for them then and it's true for us now and it's true for all that God wants to release into our church this year amen and I think Paul was so passionate about this because he had lived it he was a church destroying Christian killer and he turns into a church building Christian lover (laughs) It's like, what? What happened? You know, you better believe he knew he didn't earn his standing before God. You better believe he knew he didn't deserve the spirit. He didn't deserve the anointing. He didn't deserve the call. He didn't deserve the miracles. He would have had to do a whole lot of believing and receiving across the course of his life to actually walk in the anointing that he walked in. Can you imagine the voice of accusation in Paul's head? Like, who do you think you are? You used to destroy these people. What right do you have to speak into their life? What right do you have to build this church? What right do you... Can you imagine? Because the accuser of the brethren, he hasn't changed. He was accusing back then. He's accusing us still now. You know, like, like the voice of accuse, accusation would have been loud in his head and he would have had to very intentionally step into the call and the anointing on his life by suppressing the voice of the accuser and running to faith in God's grace. 
constant faith day after day to access his right standing before God. Like always in a message like this, you get people asking, well, what about good works then? Like where do works fit? Like does my behaviour even matter at all? And I, I want to say yes, of course it does. Like the truth about the gospel of grace does not negate other biblical truths like repentance and confession and holiness and sanctification and all those sorts of things. We just need to be very abundantly clear on the order. Like our good behaviour is a result of grace, not a key to grace. Our good behaviour is a result of our standing before God, not a key to our standing before God. You've heard that saying, don't put the cart before the horse. <laughs> and we, we can't afford to put the cart of good works before the horse of grace. That won't go anywhere. That won't be effective. The horse of grace has to go first. Mm. Like, let the horse of grace go first because where the horse of grace goes, the car of good works will follow. The scriptures tell us that it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. The horse of kindness, the car of repentance. Get the order right. Grace goes first. Grace goes first. While you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. Grace goes first. Grace went first. So I guess, you know, as I bring this message to a close, in a message like this, there's an invitation for each and every one of us to go deeper in the knowledge of grace, to not just have it in your head, but to inquire of the Lord, is this in my heart? Is this, does my heart know it? Does my soul know it? That I'm accepted in the beloved? And you might say, well, how am I going to do that? And the first thing I'm going to say, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, the performance-based pattern of this world. Don't conform to that. Rather, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renew your mind to God's Word. Get his word thoroughly into your soul because only his word has the power to demolish the strongholds, amen? It's only his word that is the sword of the spirit. It takes, it's, it, our weapons are not carnal. They're mighty in God to the demolition of strongholds. They can crush the voice of accusation in Jesus' name, but you have to actually use it. It's the sword of the Spirit, but you actually have to wield it. Like last time I checked, if we leave a sword on a shelf in its sheath, it's not going to do much damage. You have to pick it up. You have to take it out. You have to use it. Don't be content, content with just ingesting it, but let it absorb. <laughs> Meditate on the word, read it, read it, meditate on it, talk about it, go to connect, discuss it with your friends, get people to pray over you, pray it over others, all those sorts of things. So it's not just information, but Holy Spirit really brings transformation, amen? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformation comes when we're disciplined with the Word of God as a transformative agent, amen? And the other thing, fix your eyes on Jesus. As the band comes and joins me, fix your eyes on Jesus. <laughs> Rocket science to preach fix your eyes on Jesus in a church. You know, fix your eyes on Jesus. He is the centerpiece of our faith. And that means it's incumbent upon us to keep him at the centre. When we take our eyes off Jesus, that's when we get into trouble. You know, when we start looking to ourselves, when our eyes are more interested in our own behaviour than his behaviour. You know, that's when we get into trouble, when we start looking to other people, when we start looking to program, when we start looking to different places and pastors and all that sort of thing. That is when we start to go astray. We need to keep the eyes of our heart ever and always on our Saviour Jesus. It says so in Hebrew chapter 12. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Let us strip off the weight of works. Amen. It slows us down. 
especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. How do we do this? We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. He is the champion. He is the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. I love that phrase that He initiates and perfects our faith. He's not just the initiator, He's also the perfecter. He's the initiator in as much as He got the whole thing going at the cross. The very reason we can come into God's presence in His standing is because of what happened at the cross. Therefore, He is the initiator of our faith. But He's not just the initiator, He's also the perfecter of our faith. Like He, it, it means His sacrifice didn't just speak for you back then, but His sacrifice is speaking for you today. And He didn't just declare you worthy at the point of salvation, but He's declaring you worthy today. Today, and you need Him to declare you worthy today. He didn't just cover your sin, shame, flaws, mistakes and imperfections back then. He's covering all those things today. He's with you at the start line of your faith journey and He'll be there at the end, but He's also running with you every single day of your faith life and walk, (coughs) declaring you in right standing before God the Father. Isn't He glorious? And that's why we need to fix our eyes on Him because the goodness we're looking for we'll never find in ourselves. The goodness we need (laughs) is always and ever only found in Him. And and my prayer is that as our church steps into a greater knowledge of grace as we know it thoroughly in our soul, then then we'll be well-equipped to usher in everything that God has for us here and now. Devoid of the temptation to make it about ourselves and the people that have our eyes firmly fixed on Him. Amen.